All right, all right. In this video, we're going to try two different methods of polishing hamones. The first method is what Walter Sorrells and others call hybrid polishing. And the second is their traditional Japanese method, complete with special oils and finger stones. So things have been super strange around here, though, since the first hamone video called the Hammonding. Check that video out if you want. When I say strange, though, I'm talking like supernatural strange. Ugh, who sogged my clink? Zargon demands you make a machete from a lawnmower blade. I'll do it! Sucker! I was gonna do it anyway. All right, let's talk brass tacks. Our hybrid sharpening method has two things going for it. It's cheap and easy, maybe a little time consuming, whereas the traditional Japanese polishing regimen is expensive and pretty much takes a lifetime to perfect. But hey, no sweat, I'll master that in a couple of days at one tenth the normal cost, you'll see. Walter Sorrells was kind enough to send me this copy of his excellent hybrid polishing DVD. And for the traditional Japanese method, I'm going to be reading this book, The Art of Japanese Sword Polishing. Let me just crack this open and we'll see what we sees. So both of our resources focus on swords, but polishing a hamon is a huge part of their content and we can certainly apply them to our knives. As we finish up our test knives, let's talk about Japanese sword polishing. It's a very old tradition dating back a thousand plus years. It's enjoyed a rapid advancement in the aesthetics of polishing techniques as recently as the 1800s because it became illegal to carry swords in Japan and so there became this emphasis on their artistic qualities. Current methods vary among several main families, I guess. The uh, Fujishiro and Honami are, are two families named in this book, for example. Methods tend to diverge, particularly in the final stages of polishing, but from what I can read, the basic process is more or less the same. We're getting our knives all dolled up with Rutland's furnace cement and some wire to keep our clay in place. We're going to oil quench one knife and then we're going to water quench the other. The water quench knife will go through the traditional Japanese polish such as it were in my garage. Let's talk about how we're going to engineer a successful water quench. So in addition to three normalization cycles, we're going to rely on these steps to minimize cracking in water. Number one, grind thick, more than a millimeter. Number two, soap in the water, decrease the surface tension. Number three, heat the water and the oil. Number four, we're going to pop it in the tempering oven as quickly as possible without delay after the quench. So this one fractured in two spots coming down off those claying spikes there and there. We're going to try one more time here, and this time we'll have some success, thankfully. If we're just cheating here, we're going to put it in ferric chloride to get an idea of whether or not the quench was successful. And yeah, it was successful. We got a little hormone already showing up. Now we've got a handle ground in. Remember one, one through a traditional Japanese polishing, the shorter knife, and the longer one is uh, Walter Sorrell's hybrid method. And here's his DVD. It's an excellent DVD. There's a lot more to this DVD than I'm revealing here. There's a lot of tricks, specific materials, advices, how to set up polishing, all kinds of things. So it's... Uh, Something you should check out if you're interested. So after the knife is up to 1500 to 2000 grit, we're going to squeeze our lemons for its juices. You really just need one lemon for a knife. I'm going to try to degrease this in the dish. 
And of course, the Vichy Grab is never the right size. So we'll just wipe it down with acetone. Next, we add a smooch of dish soap to the lemon juice to decrease the surface tension and allow it to spread evenly over the knife. You don't want it blobbing up in an area and unequally etching. So lemon juice is a weak acid and there are plenty of opinions out there about the best acid for etching. You know, there's citrus and vinegar and diluted nitric acid and diluted ferric chloride. I sort of agree with uh, Walter Sorrells and a lot of other folks. The lemon juice seems to provide a fairly good patina and bring out a lot of details. You're going to wipe it on for about 15 to 20 minutes, then wash it well with soap and water, and then apply the polish of your preference. I'm going to get some WD-40 on here and then apply some Moz Metal Polish first. Since we have to repeat this process about seven times in my case, it varies depending on, you know, how strong your lemons are, I guess, and what type of steel you're using. Now, I'll get to try steel wool too, in addition to the Moz, and just see which one I like better. Back for round two, another 15 minutes of uh, wiping on and off lemon juice. And I'm going to take the steel wool to it, this double O steel wool. As fine as it is, it does seem to leave some scratches. So in the future, I'll probably start the first few cycles with steel wool and then finish with moss or some other metal polish. So again, I've cycled that about seven times. And as the final step, Walter recommends this 1200 grit aluminum oxide powder. You just mix it with water. You can mix it on the blade or in a spoon or whatever. And then you polish with your thumb. And you, don't worry, this 1200 grit is uh, a very, very fine grit in aluminum oxide. And as far as using it in this method, it, it actually is uh, very fine. doesn't leave any marks. This is before our aluminum oxide polish and after our seventh round of lemon juice etching. And we'll see what it looks like afterwards here in a minute. So as you can see, I'm polishing just certain areas to provide a desired effect in differential etch. So it's very much a part of polishing homones and Japanese swords is the idea that you apply different techniques to different areas and so on and so forth. It's not cheating. Now whether or not acid is cheating, that's a whole nother story. Some people just don't think it's very traditional, although this book that I'm using does mention several acids as being used, although not routinely they are used. Whether you're taking an acid, this is my opinion, and forming oxides in certain areas, or using nugui and tojiro paste and other things to deposit metal particles and oxides in places, is there is there that big a difference? You're, you're preferentially putting oxides in certain portions of the steel. So that's after the metal polish. Looks pretty good. There's a lot of definition there. That's pretty nice. Traditional polishing is divided into two main phases. There's foundation polishing called Shitoji Toji, Shitoji Togi, and finish polishing Shiagi Togi. In foundation polishing, the blade itself is run over large stones. In the finish stage, small stones are applied to the blade. In some cases, those are cut off chunks of the larger stones that you just finished with. Traditional natural Japanese foundation stones were typically sandstone or limestone or something similar in the past, but after centuries of mining, natural stones are scarce and extremely costly. Trust me, I looked into it. So in order from coarsest to finest, these stones are the Arato, Kongato, Bensui, Keisai, Chanagura, and Komanagura. These are the stones where the hamon usually becomes slightly visible. And there's two Ukigamori stones, one of which is broken into smaller pieces for the finish polishing stage. And this is what that looks like. A piece of ukigamori is broken off and made into a tiny little fingerstone called the hazuya. And this is where finish polishing begins. Next, some jizuya fingerstones of varying hardness are made in the same manner from a finer stone called naruta kido. Certain oils called nagui will be applied to bring out various portions of the ji and ha. Those oils contain various oxides and maybe some secret stuff. And even some acids like dilute nitric acid and copper sulfate can be used at times. So let's look at my B-movie version of all this. First, we got whetstones. Then more cheap whetstones. eBay Ukugamori. eBay Jizuya and Tojiru based. And eBay Kanahara Dori Nagui. 
So this is my version of traditional hamon polishing. A word on Japanese polishing stones for people who don't know. Even the synthetic ones are super expensive. A complete set of cheap stones is about $1,000. and I'm not sure that quality is great there. A complete set of good stones is north of three, three grand. So <laughs> that's why I'm using these rinky neat combo stones. It's going to set me back all day. I'm going to be backtracking and coming back up on grit and going back down. But I'll finally get it to about a decent 3,000 grit and we'll call that sort of the foundation polishing now if i knew what i was doing i would blame the stones these cheap stones as the limiting factor here but i really wouldn't know what to do with real foundation stones anyway you know as good as this book is and it is a, a great book you obviously cannot learn what these master polishers learn in you know decades um, by spending two hours with the book so I started at a 200 grit off the belt grinder. And like I said, literally about seven hours later, I got it where it needed to go. You can definitely tell towards the end here that the hamon is very much visible. I guess there's some buildup depositing within the steel structure or something on the surface, and maybe some oxides are forming, rusting, whatever. So here we go. We're almost ready for finish polishing. I'm going to reconsult my source, make sure I have an understanding of what's going on here. But I do have to cut off first this uh, block of 3,000 grit polishing stone. I'm going to fix it to some paper bags with some epoxy and we're going to sort of cut it up in much in, in the way that the Japanese might configure some of their finger stones. Again this would typically be done for the polishing stage, the finish stage, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I didn't have stones uh, to, to bridge that gap. So I'm just going to make a finger stone out of 3000 grit and we're going to finish our foundation polishing like this. And not too bad. So these Hazuya stones are made from flaking Ukumori stones and then fitting them to paper with traditional Japanese lacquer. And that's how these came from eBay. Using these finger stones should remove smudges and line marks from the blade. But first I need to smooth out their surfaces a little bit and their edges. So I'll do that here on this other stone. There's certainly more technique to applying these stones than you'll see here. Uh, and even though it's well described in the book without a demonstration and you know someone showing me hands on how to do this I doubt that I'm doing this entirely correctly so if you know better I'm sorry Now the Jizuya stones. These were made from flaking off a finer stone called the Narutokido. And they're made in a very similar fashion to the Hazuya. I've already flattened this one. Uh, you can see it here. I'm flattening it with a, another stone prior to use, much like I did the Hazuya stone. There's three apparently successively hard or finer Jizuya stones that you would use. I only have one, so that's just what we're going to have to do. And at this stage, often there's a paste called tajiru, which is actually uh, ground up little bits of ukigamori in water, and that's used to facilitate polishing. The ukigamori just makes its way into a lot of these polishing processes, I guess.
So here we can see an improvement from the finish from the Hazuya stone or Ukugamori to the Jazuya stone. It's a little bit finer, you know, it's a little bit hard to tell. Now for the application of the Nagui, uh, which is a liquid basically made from ground forge scale or iron oxide in one form or another, combined with clove oil. In the, face of, in the case of Kanahadori Nagui, it's made with clove oil and, again, the forge scale. In the case of Sashikomi Nagui, it's made from magnetite. There is a very traditional way of filtering this through a special paper, some people use a coffee filter, and then applying it with a cotton called omueta, and we don't have that. So I filtered it through a paper towel to get all the particles out of it, and then we're applying it with a Q-tip. I don't know. The Nugi should uh, add character to the hamon, and depending on what type you use, it may even darken certain areas, like Sashikomi Nugui will darken the G more than the Ha. It didn't do much, so I'm going to boil it in water and see if I can heat it up, which is a technique used for the Sashikomi Nugui, not necessarily the Kanahanadori that we're using, but I just want to see if it changes the effect and makes the Kanahanadori Nugui do something noticeable. After the nagui is applied to brighten the hamon, a hadori stone is used, which is essentially another hazuya stone, only shaped a bit smaller to get into very specific crevices in the hamon, and it's applied to the hamon in, in very tiny strokes, right where you need it. So, you know, it looks okay. It's a very interesting, you know, process. But there's none of this extra activity I was hoping to sort of coax out of the Samoan. And maybe that has to do with the, my clay pattern itself being too simple or my ineptitude <laughs> with these stones and, and this technique. But I'm going to go back and apply some lemon juice and see if I can coax some more stuff out of the Samoan and see, you know, if there's something there that I just didn't get with this uh, polishing that I used. So we'll go through several cycles of lemon juice and aluminum oxide, which will also refine the grit and the polish of the blade more than I could get with my you know, inexpensive stones. You can see that we did coax some extra activity out of that. Not a whole lot, it is just a plain, a uh, very ordinary hamon, but there's these two areas with a little bit of extra stuff. This Wingewood handled 1084 water quenched one is going to go to a buddy. The black G10 handled one right here is going to get to auction eventually. I'll keep you guys updated on that. In the meantime, man, I learned a lot. What a fun experiment. I'm going to keep working on that. I'll probably refine my technique and share with you guys what I'm learning. Man, I'm just so glad that Zargon guy is gone. What's the deal? Play that funky inch, inch, inch. Quiet, get out of here. Oh, that knife broke. You may no longer have Zargon's lawnmower blade. Shh, I'm recording. What are you doing here? Get back in the mirror. Zargon, the devourer of souls, has escaped the twelfth dimension yet again. Devourer of souls? More like clogger of sinks. What did you put in there? Uh, Zargon is famished. Where is your mustard? Not now go away. Oh, what is this? Now, now, like a four-year-old, devour of souls, my ass.